We just hit a thousand subscribers, which is amazing. Thank you. Thank you for all of your likes. Thank you for subscribing and for all of your wonderful comments. It's been awesome to hear how these videos are helping you learn, become better security professionals and pass the CISSP exam. So thank you. And now back to our regular scheduled programming. Hey, I'm Rob Witcher, and I'm here to help you pass the CISSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to models and frameworks in Domain 3 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the first of nine videos for Domain 3. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. As security professionals, we need to protect the assets of the organization. Everything from the people, the data, the systems, the processes, the network, the entire enterprise. This is not an easy thing to do. It's difficult to conceptualize and think through all of the components of these complex systems and processes of an entire organization. And security needs to be involved and embedded throughout all of this, throughout the entire organization. How then do we tackle this rather intractable problem? Models. So. What are models? They are conceptual representations of things. They allow us to shrink something down and simplify it. We have models of cars and models of planes and models of enterprise security architectures. Models help us break down complex systems into their components. Once we understand the components that combine to create a complex system, we can protect each of the components and thus tackle the problem of baking security into every aspect of even highly complex systems. We're going to talk through how we have models that focus just on confidentiality or integrity or preventing conflicts of interest. And we're going to start with models that cover the entire enterprise security architecture. Let's begin with some definitions. An architecture is simply a bunch of components that work together. A security architecture is how we protect, how we secure each of the components in the architecture. And an enterprise security architecture is how we protect all of the components of the enterprise, the people, processes, systems, networks, etc. There are three major enterprise security architectures that you should know about. The first is the Zachman framework. It defines a two-dimensional table, which provides a structured way of defining an enterprise and therefore breaking it down into its components. The Zachman framework defines how, where, who, when, and why as the columns of the table. And then some other stuff as the rows of the table. Honestly, you don't need to memorize this table. Just know that Zachman is an enterprise security architecture. SABSA, the Sherwood Applied Business Security Architecture, was developed independently of Zachman, but has a very similar structure. The primary characteristic of SABSA is that it defines a risk-driven enterprise security architecture model that is derived from an analysis of the business requirements for security. But again, you don't need to memorize the specifics of SABSA. TOGAF, the Open Group Architecture Framework, is the third major enterprise security architecture framework. And just like Zachman and SABSA, TOGAF helps you break an organization down into components so you can build security into each component. And those are the three enterprise security architectures that you need to know about. Now, let's look at security models, of which there are two major groupings, lattice-based and rule-based. We'll start with lattice-based. Lattice-based essentially means layers. We define different layers of confidentiality or integrity, and then define rules about what can be read or written between the layers to maintain confidentiality or integrity. Bellapadula or Bellapadula, depending on how you want to pronounce it, is a confidentiality only model. It is entirely focused on maintaining the confidentiality of information. Because it is a lattice or layer based model, you define different layers of confidentiality from lower secrecy or confidentiality up to higher layers of secrecy. And the model defines rules for controlling what a subject a person or a process can do between these layers. The first rule is the simple security property, and it states that to maintain confidentiality, you can only read at your own level and below, you can only read down. The second rule is the star property, 
and it states that to maintain confidentiality, you can only write data at your own level and above. You can only write up. And the third rule is the strong star property, and it states that if you are both reading and writing, you can only do so at your own level. So Bella Padula, all about confidentiality. You can only read down, write up, and read right at your own level. The second latticed or layer-based model is BIBA. BIBA is all about integrity. Just remember, the I in BIBA stands for integrity. And again, because it is a layer-based model, you define layers. But with BIBA, they are layers of integrity, lower, medium, or higher integrity. And as you've probably guessed, the model defines rules controlling what a subject can do between layers to maintain integrity. The first rule is the simple integrity property, and it states that to maintain integrity, you can only read up. If you were to read down, you would be reading less meaningful or accurate data. So you can only read at your own level or above. You can only read up. The second rule is the star integrity property, which states that to maintain integrity, you can only write down. If you wrote up, you would be corrupting more accurate data. So you can only write down. Just remember, it's the inverse of Bella Padula. There is a third rule, the invocation property, but you don't need to know about it. Here's a simple diagram that might help you memorize these two important models. Biba is essentially a mirror or the inverse of Bella Padula. And remember, the I in Biba stands for integrity. The final piece we will talk about related to latticed based models is not actually a model at all. It's an implementation. The Bella Padula and Biba models are essentially inverse to each other. So if you want to maintain both confidentiality and integrity, how do you combine these models? Lipner figured it out, and thus it is known as the Lipner implementation, combining both confidentiality and integrity. Now let's talk about rule-based models. There are a few of them. First, we have the Clark-Wilson model, which just like Biba is all about integrity, but the Clark-Wilson model goes a lot deeper. It defines three goals of integrity, preventing unauthorized subjects from making any changes, preventing authorized subjects from making bad changes, and maintaining the consistency of the system. To achieve these three goals, it defines three rules. You must have well-formed transactions, you must have separation of duties, and number three, you must have the access triple, subject, program, and object. The Brewer-Nash model, also known as the Chinese wall model, has one goal, preventing conflicts of interest. There are a couple of other models that you should simply recognize as being rule-based models. Graham Denning, for instance, specifies rules about allowing subjects access to an object. And Harrison Ruzel Allman is an enhancement of Graham Denning. It adds generic rights. But again, just know it as a rule-based model. Now, let's talk about the major security, privacy, and risk frameworks that you need to know about for the exam. We'll begin with the security frameworks, which focus on security. Wow. They focus on security. The major framework that you need to know a fair bit about is ISO 27001. It is the most widely used security framework in the world. ISO 27001 provides best practice recommendations for an ISMS, an information security management system. In other words, ISO 27001 defines 114 controls across 14 domains or categories. These controls define all of the best practices you should have in place for a well-run security program, starting from the top with security governance, security policies, through onboarding, asset management, access control, cryptography, physical security, network security, and all the way to having a compliance function. It is important to remember that ISO 27001 defines the controls, and you can therefore be ISO 27001 certified. ISO 27002, on the other hand, provides the code of practice for information security controls, provides the implementation guidance for the controls in 27001. So, can you be certified against ISO 27002? No, it's just a guidance document. Now, the next few security control frameworks that I'm going to talk about, you do not need to be an expert on them. Simply know what they are primarily focused on and used for. NIST 800-53, for instance, provides a set of security and privacy controls for U.S. federal agencies. 
COBIT, the Control Objectives for Information and Related Technologies, was created by IT security auditors at ASACA. And because it was created by IT auditors, it is particularly useful for IT audit and assurance work. COSO, the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations of the Treadway Commission, that's a mouthful, was an initiative in the U.S. in the 1980s to combat corporate fraud. While COSO is primarily focused on financial reporting controls, it does contain a requirement for reasonable security. ITIL, the Information Technology Infrastructure Library, defines a framework of best practices for delivering IT services that are aligned with business goals and objectives. So ITIL is particularly useful for looking at IT processes like change management, configuration management, access management, event management, availability management, and so on and so on. HIPAA, the Health, Insurance, Portability, and Accountability Act, predictably is a framework focused on safeguarding medical healthcare information. SOX, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. We can thank Enron and WorldCom for this U.S. federal law. SOX requires top management, the CEO, CFO, to individually certify the accuracy of financial information. And if fraudulent activity is found, the penalties are much more severe. The security aspect of SOX is that the financial records must have integrity and be available. Now, let's look at an important privacy guideline and a major privacy regulation. We'll start with the guideline, specifically the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD Privacy Guidelines or Principles. I cover the OECD guidelines in a lot more detail as part of the second Domain 2 video, which I've linked to. The major privacy regulation that you need to know about is GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which is the core of the European Union's digital privacy legislation. I also talk about GDPR in more detail in that same Domain 2 video. Now let's talk about risk frameworks. The major risk framework that you need to know a wee bit about is NIST 800-37, the Risk Management Framework. The RMF provides a structured process for managing security and privacy risk. Make sure you know the six steps of the RMF and the order of them. Basically, step one, categorize information systems. Two, select security controls. Three, implement security controls. Four, assess security controls. Five, authorize information systems. And six, monitor. The following three frameworks you should just recognize as frameworks that contain risk management components. It is highly unlikely that you'll get specific questions on any of them. ISO 31000, COSO, and ASACA Risk IT. And that is an overview of models and frameworks within Domain 3, covering the most critical concepts to know for the exam. If you found this video helpful, you can hit the thumbs up button. And if you want to be notified when we release additional videos in this mind map series, then please subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notifications. I'll provide links to the other mind map videos in the description below. Thanks very much for watching and all the best in your studies.